Pop culture arguments are nothing new. We've been embroiled in them at comic conventions since the 1970s. Whether it was Marvel vs. DC or Star Wars vs. Star Trek, the act of debate has always been very present in fan culture. I made an error in creating you. The creation of perfection is no error. One person would say how they preferred Captain Kirk's swagger, and another would counter that Captain Picard's introspective manner was their preference. After about 15 minutes of back and forth, everyone would head to the food court to find some chicken tenders and fries. But that was then. And this is now. Somewhere in the past, the timeline skewed into this tangent. You might be quick to cite the internet as the simple reason for the change in fan behavior that I'm about to look at, but I don't think it's necessarily that simple. In the years since home internet and the Star Wars prequels coming into existence, fan debate has rapidly devolved into something akin to a war crimes trial, where your loyalty to the state is questioned if you show the slightest bit of displeasure with the current state of affairs. Everyone swore to it. It was mandatory. You could see what was coming. Prior to the prequels, very few people accused you of hating 20th Century Fox or Lucasfilm if you didn't like Ewoks. But somewhere around the time of Rick Berman's Star Trek and George Lucas' Star Wars prequels, fan debate started to become a loyalty gambit. At the time, the discussions were mainly between creator preferences, Roddenberry versus Berman, Lucas versus Kurtz. The discussions still had some amount of merit, but the slope was becoming visible visibly slippery. But after Revenge of the Sith, suddenly it was about loyalty. Loyalty to a man. A man not one person who argued the point had actually met or spoken to. I experienced it firsthand on a Star Wars podcast I was in in the mid-2000s. I think Empire's unique because it had the most creative conflict, uh, to put it kindly, between yeah. some of the major right. players. Right. Yeah. And you talk about um, their differences and things, and I get angry when I hear people talk about Lucas and how he, he's selfish or this, that, and the other. I have seen so much documentary stuff behind the scenes and stuff, and George is always pushing people's creativity to do what they want to do, be creative, and he chooses what he decides uh, he likes best. He takes so many things, different ideas that other people come up with, and he uses them. And But the bottom line is this whole thing is George, and he has the last say in everything. And I just it, that really drives me nuts when people bash him. And to hear them tell the story, Lucas was a benevolent deity, and our criticism of his films was entirely unfair. We were ungrateful groundlings that didn't deserve to breathe the same air. This became the normal tactic in fan debate for several years. During this time, Marvel and DC made waves in movie theaters with their tentpole films. And God help you if you didn't like one of the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight films or the new 52 reset of DC Comics. To do so was to invite accusations of not being a Batman fan or not being a true DC Comics fan. If you spoke ill of DC Comics headman Dan DiDio, you were a craven and had had betrayed your tribe. There's no going back. You've changed things. Around this period, Star Trek was reborn under the J.J. Abrams banner, and the rhetoric and fan debate was similar. If you don't like these films, you are not a Star Trek fan. There wasn't a substantive discussion of the merits of these creative decisions. Instead, the debate was rapidly hijacked and twisted into an assessment of your personal loyalty to the franchise in question. And franchise is what it was really all about. Because after Lucas sold Star Wars to Disney, and the news came out that Disney had thrown all of Lucas's idea to the side, the defenders of the Disney films, who had previously been many of the Lucas defenders, lost little sleep in siding with Disney in the wake of the news. It hadn't ever been about loyalty to Lucas. It was about loyalty to a logo. I suggest you look wherever you find the most heinous, blatant, and vile exploitation of children on the planet. Coop, what the Disney world? 
I had a very close friend at the time who was in a mental quandary over the same type of situation with DC Comics. He said he didn't like Man of Steel, but he had to own the Blu-ray of the film. Then, despite our agreement about the film's unnecessary departures from the character of Superman, he quickly convinced himself he liked Man of Steel, and said he wouldn't be a fan of DC Comics if he didn't. It was a tribal reflex. Integrity was less important than fabricated feelings of inclusion in a group. But it wasn't a group. It wasn't a tribe. In both the case of Star Wars and the case of DC Comics, the loyalty they prided themselves on and demanded of others was to a corporation, a company. And such reactions always came with a version of the phrase, to be fair, whether it was, let's be fair, or in all fairness, or playing devil's advocate here, which is funny if you think about it because the person willing to advocate for the devil is always advocating for a faceless company. Wow, that was pretty brutal even by my standards. God, this poetry just writes itself. There was no bottom to the excuses these fans were making for corporate entities. And the sickest part of all this? The mandate that one should be fair when talking about the decisions made by a corporation, and in these cases an entertainment corporation to boot, is baseless. Let's disregard the fact that from the moment you're born, every person on earth is told over and over again that life isn't fair. Let's also acknowledge the worthy and idealistic perspective that to change the world, you should be the change. So if you believe in fairness, you should give fairness. I totally agree with you when it's in between individual people. I practice fairness with every in-person encounter I experience. But they don't want you to be fair with a person. They want you to be fair about the decisions of a company. A faceless company that doesn't know their customers' names and would step over your dying corpse in a storm drain if stopping to help you meant the loss of five dollars of profit. It hurts when I breathe. Well, then what do you think you should stop doing? What I'm driving at here is this. Big business has never been about fairness. Never in the history of commerce across human existence has business been steeped in any sense of fairness. Sometimes I think the greatest con job ever pulled was whoever came up with brand loyalty. It's the biggest oxymoron since military intelligence and the biggest scam. First, let's look at the structure of companies. Despite many existing and finding their success in Western democracies, every company is run like a small dictatorship, with the CEO at the top giving orders that are rarely countermanded without significant intervention from the board of directors, and usually only in a reactionary capacity after a terrible decision has already done its damage. These companies in the modern age show no fairness or loyalty to their employees, and over the last half century, have taken away their pensions, benefits, pay raises, and promotions without a tear shed or a moment's hesitation. Company cultures are always one new executive away from being somewhat survivable to a cutthroat purge. How many people have you heard of that were less than a year from retirement and were fired before their pension kicked in? How many times have you heard about corporations targeting their longest serving employees for termination because their legacy salaries are the largest across the various departments? Your severance package. I've got two mortgages, a son who's going to college, and five years from retirement. I think we can all acknowledge that none of this is fair. Decision makers within companies love to use phrases like, this is the cost of doing business, and it's not personal. I'm 60 years of age, Frank. It isn't personal, Mike. They expect all of us to buy into this tactic of stripping the human element out of decision making so we will be okay with whatever they decide. In fact, within corporations these days, they harp and harp about emotional intelligence and how important it is to have developed emotional intelligence skills. This is one of those fake outs of nomenclature, very similar to how a politician names a bill. You know, how they'll write a law to say, allow for the wholesale slaughter of bears, and they'll name the bill the Bear Preservation Act. 
That's what corporate emotional intelligence is. Not getting mad at the office when you are screwed over by your leader's decisions. Being okay and not fighting back when you are treated unfairly. Turning your emotions off entirely for the benefit of the corporate leader's convenience. And yet in fandom debates, the other side couches their defense of these companies in human terms. Be fair with them. Wait, I just realized I only illustrated the unfairness present within the walls of companies that employees experience daily. We should quickly talk about all of the fairness customers experience when dealing with companies. I'm gonna make this very, very simple. If companies deserved fairness from us, the class action lawsuit would never have become a thing. But let's dig a little deeper. Corporations throughout history have both figuratively and literally tried to get away with murder on a regular basis. The numbers of lawsuits and criminal charges brought against companies for using harmful chemicals in products, poisoning rivers and lakes, playing dirty games with people's mortgages, hitting people with illegal fees and costs, making cars they know explode in collisions, knowingly employing people who are abusing their employees, and knowingly working with factories that abuse child labor. Oh, this isn't good! These incidents are endless and hardly show concern for fairness in society. Even backing away from these examples to just the normal day of a consumer and tell me where the fairness is in the relationship between consumer and manufacturer. The manufacturer decides what will get made, how much of it will get made, how much it will cost, what laws they will lobby to change to skim more profit off taxpayers and become less accountable to said taxpayers. The manufacturer decides what products will be discontinued, what products will have prices increased. Do I need to go on? The consumer is voiceless in all of these decisions barring the focus groups that may or may not be conducted. And even then, the results of those processes aren't mandatory to act on. And I'm not saying the consumer should have a voice in all of these decisions. What I am saying is, in an environment where fairness is not a factor in 99% of commerce's decisions toward the customer, the customer is under little to no obligation to reciprocate fairness in dealings with companies. Hey, Goldman Sachs, on behalf of the American middle class, you. Brand loyalty is a fool's errand because there is no customer loyalty. Not unless you count those worthless discount programs that only reward you for buying more stuff after the huge initial purchase that didn't get the benefit of the loyalty program. Make no mistake, companies want their buyers to feel obligations of loyalty and fairness because that street is all one way and they get all of the benefits, like a friend who always gets to borrow money but never gets asked to lend any. Companies didn't have to deal very much with customer voices being heard before the internet existed. And in the pre-internet days, it took a Herculean effort for customers to organize against a corporation when an injustice was upon them. These days, customers have a very effective platform to be heard, and that includes being heard by the entertainment industry. Yet, fandom is now split because a measurable fraction of the fan community believes loyalty to these corporations equates to loyalty toward their interests. Sadly, this couldn't be more incorrect. In most cases, they are not protecting their interests by siding with the company in fan discussions and demanding fans show these companies their nebulous idea of fairness. You should never, under any circumstances, defend a company that doesn't pay you a salary and doesn't know your name. Even when you work for that company, you should think twice before sticking your neck out to defend them because they'll get rid of you to save $10 next quarter if Wall Street recommends it. When you're in these debates with fans, it's okay to disagree with each other about liking a movie or TV show, but doubling down by declaring loyalty or even sympathy to the parent company is a troubling trend. And what's worse, these fans often attempt to turn the tables and say that complaining fans are to blame for the latest terrible film, either because they didn't support the film at the box office or because the studio allegedly listened to the complaining fans and it resulted in a terrible film, as was the case, they say, with The Rise of Skywalker. You've been in this camp too long. You put two and two together and it comes out four, only it ain't four. But they blame fandom in a blanket accusation. What is this anyway, a kangaroo court? Why don't you get a rope and do it right? They blame toxic fans and trolling fans and man-baby fans. 
I suppose some jerk's gonna say I did it. But no blame should ever be allowed to touch the corporation that owns the franchise and made all the decisions in the latest production. It's a pretty sick mentality. And whatever you do to me, you're gonna have to do all over again when you find the right guy. Beat up the people that are in the same boat as you and have just as little control as you do over these creative decisions. Don't allow a discussion to occur. Instead, demonize your fellow enthusiasts in defense of a logo owned by a company. Be a good little soldier for that big company that makes things for you to buy. He's lying, he's just trying to get himself off the hook. Non-essential companies like the entertainment industry exist solely to convince you to part with discretionary income. That's it. Full stop. How well they do that is down to the quality of the content they create. But insistence that we be fair with them in our reviews of their products is an empty-headed demand, especially when the internet finally gives consumers a level of volume that can reach their ears. And yet here you are saying we shouldn't use this tool, and I'm sure big business appreciates you fighting for such voluntary suppression. If I ever run into any of you bums on a street corner, just let's pretend we never met before. They say all is fair in love and war. There was never a mention of business in that quote. And that's what this is. Business. The fans are all in this together as consumers. Whether the fan across the table agrees with you or not about a movie or TV show, they're your only equal in the equation. To say you prefer to stand with a company puts you a significant step away from your peers, your fellow fans. And you remind me of one of those prison trustees in a lockup film that actively helps the corrupt warden. One day, that company you're holding a torch for will be gone, or they'll sell your favorite IP to another company, and you'll still have those fans you rejected at the other side of the table. And they'll remember how quick you were to scab up and side with the man. Brother, were we all wet about you? Forget it. Mickey Mouse isn't going to be there to help you. I guarantee it. They need you right now. But when they don't, they'll cast you out. Maybe instead, you should just disagree on the salient points of the movie or TV series being discussed and drop the demands for advocacy and sympathy toward the corporation making it. And while you're at it, stop placing the blame on the rest of fandom. The company can defend itself. And trust me, they do it with impunity every day. They don't need you or your voice. Sycophancy for a company does nothing to bolster your position in a debate and serves only to erode your credibility in the discussion with those who challenge your opinion. Because big business, whether it's a movie studio or a toy company, has already established the rules of engagement, and they're not built on any kind of fairness. Insisting on treating these companies fairly in fandom is no different than the guy who thought he had a special connection with bears. That bear will always be a bear. And big business will always be big business. But some fans have fooled themselves into believing they can be friends with the studios and toy companies. Do I have to remind you what happened to the guy who thought the bear was his friend?